Welcome to Sketchcraft, the podcast for art, design, and process junkies. I'm Rob Duenas, art director for Game Fan Magazine and Artist Esquire. This is an unedited podcast, which means that there is some cursing from time to time, so please be aware. Thanks for listening, and here we go. Okay, <sighs> like a firecracker, here we go. Sketch Rants. Thank you all for joining me for the last and final little bit here on Art Thieving for now. So this is Sketch Rants episode 4. Yes, episode 4. Or 2-B, depending on what Mario zone you exist in. So what am I talking about? So in the last two Sketch Rants, uh, which is this little soapbox format I use for the Sketchcraft podcast... Uh, I talked about art thieving. Um, one would be stealing out, right? Artwork would be episode two. Episode three was influences, which is not really about thieving at all. Uh, go listen to it if you want to know what that was about. And then now I'm going to get into the widest of topics. Widest, in, um, <laughs> I don't mean in terms of your color of your skin. I mean in theory, you know, uh, intention emotional aspect black dark black, right and that's inspirational versus working in a house style and i briefly talked about this a little bit in the last podcast so i'm going to get into it and then bring up one other thing i was talking about which is redrawing art versus homages um so let's start with redrawing art versus homages so sometimes you have two things come up uh with this sort of topic when you have an homage, and what that means is, case in point, I have a new cover for Big Dog I'm working on for Critter, and it's a tribute cover, an homage to Spider-Man issue one that Todd McFarlane drew, that classic Spider-Man kneeling, kind of ducking under the cover thing. And the main Critter, the main character Critter, she's she's doing the same thing. I mean, she has like yarn all over the place. Like she's playing yarn instead of spider webs, yarn all over the, the place. And if you're unfamiliar, go look up Spider-Man issue one, Todd McFarlane. So that's an homage. And what that would be is when I get done with it, I'll put, you know, in the signature, you know, rad, whatever, and then another after Todd. So anytime you do an homage, it's sort of redrawing a popular image or a cover um, with your own characters or your own subject material using that exact format, and you're giving credit to where credit's due. That's an homage. Uh, redrawing art outright uh, or swiping it as it's sort of known to me or biting off would be another thing uh that's something that sadly uh there are whole blogs devoted to if you like i don't want to throw this guy under the bus but if you look at cats like uh okay like wizard comics back in the day did did a little article on that like with adding adam kubert there was there was you know panels of x-men that were basically redraws of panels from Wildcats, where you literally could put them over one another, and instead of Zealot, now it's Gambit. Uh, you know, Rob Liefeld's sort of been accused of this many times, and I'm not going to say yay or nay on it one way or the other. But you go look it up on the internet, you could find these sorts of blogs where it's like, you know, you can put the pose right over, you can see that it's clearly the other art before, but now it's your character. That's sort of swiping or biting off someone's artwork. Um, do not endorse that. I think that's lazy. Uh, if that's happening there's a strong temptation to i understand with deadlines and everything else um, i've been in the position where you know rob you could swipe this and you know it just i'm not gonna act like i'm i'm you know mr high and mighty a boy scout because i'm not um but when it comes to this i've seen this so often growing up that if i if i draw something and if you go, wow, this is just like this, you shouldn't be able to hold the two up and see the layout uh, verbatim. You, It might be familiar to you. It might go, okay, 
this reminds me of that. It's the same idea. But I didn't just take that layout and draw my characters into it and call it a day. Or take the pose outright, you know, crop the hair and put a cape on there and now it's mine. There's no excuse for that. I think, in my opinion, you're cheating your customer. I, I don't get into it from an artistic standpoint, what's right and wrong, you know, in terms of what an artist does. I'm looking at the person buying my art. Since I'm a commercial artist and wannabe and all that other stuff, I'm like, well, they bought that art. I, mean, I could give them something like this, but I should never steal something. Uh, plus, you never fucking know who you're going to run across in life. Case in point, you know, I was a big fan of LaShawn Thomas. I still am. I don't mean in the past tense, but I'm a big fan of LaShawn Thomas's artwork. And when he sort of made a name for himself in independent comics, like a dream wave, like I want to say 2004, 2005, you know, the TMP stuff and the Arcanium, I thought the shit was hella cool. I couldn't read half of it. Like, I didn't think the art tied into the words very well, um, for whatever reasons that were. However, I thought the art was sick. You know, I still think the art is fucking awesome. When it came time to do some stuff um, independently, with Turtles and a bunch of other stuff I was working on at the time, there was that strong, like, you know, oh, this will be the, the fresh stuff to, like, this is what I wanted to use. And I remember thinking to myself at that point, you know, Rob, you may one day be sitting at a convention next to LaShawn Thomas, and he could look at your art and not go, wow, Rob was influenced by me, but that's, you know, the cover I drew, or that's panel two, you know, on page 14 that I drew. And it, being that I used to, I used to say, oh, I didn't used to say, I, I grew up going to San Diego Comic Con. And rather than standing in the line to get my art reviewed, I would go to the front of the line as a kid and watch portfolios. And over and over and over, I would see this over and over and over. This is from panel six, Spawn, whatever. This is from panel two, Wildcats. This is from panel three, X-Men. This is from panel four, Avengers. And it's all, in, you know, redrawn. And I could not allow that to happen. No matter how much, you know, it would be like, oh, it would be so great. You can't do that. And so case in point, you know, 2009, I'm sitting at... At the booth at, at play, you know, we had we had a booth at Comic Con. I'm sitting there, and guess who's sitting next to me for three days? LaShawn Thomas, because he's friends with Dave Howards, my employer. And I'm sitting there thinking to myself, like, this is the funniest fucking thing ever, you know? Like, like I'm sitting next to a guy, you know, that I said one day I might be sitting next to, and four or five years later, I'm sitting next to him drawing for three days. And, and, and I was so glad I didn't have that shit in there, that I wasn't so enamored or, well, you know, and it's a compliment. You know, when you're really impressed or inspired by someone's art, you know, that's a compliment. But you cannot cross the line and draw over their work and call it your own. It could be influence. He has his influences, all right? We all have our influences. And, and that's what I want to get back into, inspirational versus a house style. And inspirational means that um, I did a Psychonauts tribute piece for Play Magazine in 2009. And they wanted to put all these Psychonaut characters on there. It was going to be a tribute to uh, Tim Schafer, the director and creator of Psychonauts. And, you know, um, a couple of the layout ideas that I was... I remember thinking, well, I want to show a bit of the background. I want to show the characters all at the camp. And... So I had a, a bunch of reference pixels to kind of look at some layouts of people that have sort of executed that sort of format that I've never drawn. Never, never drawn. A bunch of characters at that point. And so I'm looking at like uh, some wallpapers for Wario, the Wario Wii game or Power Stone. And I'm like looking at it like, okay, there's this cool thing that the, some of the times the Japanese have seen this, this layout where they'll take a globe, like a map layout, and they'll curve the background and show you like you know you know like a curved surface and that character is kind of reaching out coming towards you right pointing at you or holding their hand up like warriors holding the peace sign or in power stone like they're they're kind of like pointing or whatever and so i was like i'm going to use like that you know that sort of basic layout that that idea and i use that as inspiration like i looked at it and so okay that's kind of what i wanted to go and i showed it to my employer i'm thinking this kind of layout and he goes okay yeah, we agree on that and then i go and i work on my own working with that style now when people saw the piece i had everyone go oh i've seen this that's power stone i'm like yeah i i get that that was the inspiration but you can't line it up verbatim i didn't jack the power stone art insert my characters it's that idea and and frankly there's really no way to work around that i mean um i mean there is you know you could just not do it at all however to me that's not breaking the that's my personal opinion i'm not breaking the rule 
you know, I'm, I'm being smart in that I'm picking a layout that's tried and true that works. This is a formula that works. And now I'm actually re-executing on my own. I'm not tracing over. I'm on my own. I'm sitting down and saying, okay, I'm going to make this fit this mold and move forward. Sometimes I don't have to do that at all. Uh, usually, usually when it comes to something I've never drawn before, I'll go and find someone who's been successful at it first. Just like if I was to say, Rob, like I had an opportunity to work uh, to do a bunch of horror comics, like the Saw comics. I'm like, Rob, we want to do the Saw comics. So I started looking around at horror comics. Well, what's kind of working right now? And when I'm working on T-shirts, that's what I would do. I would say, okay, Rob, they would put me on West Coast Choppers. I'd go and start to look at West Coast Chopper shirts, not to redraw or give them more of what they have, but to, just to be fucking aware of, of what's currently trending and that sort of thing. And then say, okay, do you want to do this? And let them sort of decide what they want. My editors or my art directors, let them decide what direction they want me to go in. And it's for me to then take that and, and, and use that art that's inspired and make it original. Okay. Um, and that's a very difficult thing to, to lay out. Not a lot of artists talk about this because usually it's kindling for for uh, a shitstorm. <laughs> um, there's a gnome on DVD that... Uh, who is it? It's... It's drawing backgrounds, historical backgrounds or something. It's this Photoshop layout. Um, let me see if I can bring up really quickly here. The um, Hold on, let me, let me pause really quick and bring this up so I can mention it. All right, so here it is. I got it. It's uh, the Nomon Workshop. They got you know, these trading DVDs. Or they're interesting. Uh, uh, they're usually a good re- resource not so much for the subject material, but for the conversation. Uh, I'm not a big fan of the material in general, and that um, I don't think you're just going to instantly download the information. Like if I look at it now, I know how to do it. That's not really. But I do enjoy the conversation that come. I think a lot of true shit comes across in these things. Uh, it's fun to to listen to, and it's always sound advice. One of the ones that I'm a fan of is James Klein. You know, he's a he's a famous conceptual conceptual artist in Hollywood. You know, he's worked on Titan. He's worked on he's worked on everything. Yeah. Minority Report, all sorts of shit. So, but he has a DVD called Historical Set Design. And he talks about kit bashing. And that means, like, in an art department, uh, you know, you're developing backgrounds, you know, and and, and um, artwork, say, like, on the jungles or, you know, wherever. And sometimes they'll give you reference picks to use. But more often than not, realistically, you got to go to Google and you grab a bunch of images. You know, it's not legal, but you're grabbing a bunch of images and you're using them. To, to put in his artwork to get the concept art out. And uh, uh, and he's like, look, and a lot of that, a lot of people like to talk about this, but that's just the way it's done. And you go, oh, that's stealing. Well, so you know, right? There's a little movie called Star Wars. You know where that, the term kit bashing comes from? Right? Go look at a movie called Star Wars. It was released in like 1977. You may have heard of it. And there's this uh, thing in Star Wars called spaceships, like the Millennium Falcon. Right? And there's all these little bits and pieces on the fucking Millennium Falcon. I'm sorry. I don't mean to, to curse. Right? But on the Millennium Falcon, there's all these pieces. And what they did is they had concept art, some paintings, and they built a basic mold, the, the, the shape, the little, you know, Pac-Man shape of the ship. And then they went and bought thousands of model kits. Okay? Thousands of model kits. World War II vehicles, whatever. And they took all these pieces off the models and glued them on to make all the fuselages and and the, the hoses and the tubes. That's what's on the Death Star. That's, I mean, all those starships are made up of those things. That's called kit bashing. Take a bunch of models, put them together, and you get all this instant detail. Because there's no, it's a, it would be impossible to actually go and have someone, you know. Sorry, folks. So it would be impossible to have someone go out there and die cut all these bits and pieces. Right. So what are you supposed to do? Pay testers model and Ravel um what? A penny for every bit used or something? Like what are you what are you supposed to do? You know? You you, you use these bits and pieces, um, and you make them unrecognizable. Right? I'm not taking a model of a World War II plane, gluing it together and putting it on film and claiming it as my own. You're taking all these little kit bashing pieces and putting it together. In a way that's sort of what I'm talking about. Where you can sort of take these layouts and go, Okay, this is the fundamental thing I'm going to do to move on with approval and then you go and you completely re-execute and you flip it and you do what you do so it moves out of that you know 10 20 percent range i would say 
you need to move out of the 50-60% range. What I mean is it shouldn't be 10 or 20% like something. It should be 70 to 80% unlike something. You know, and just 10 to 20% vaguely you can, oh, I remember that. And that's just to give, in my opinion, people room or your customers room to anchor them towards something that they're familiar with. If I hand them something that's so radically different, and mind you, I've I've done that. There's artists that do really great, radically dynamic art. And it, it's so polarizing for me as an artist. I was very unable to get work doing that. Uh, someone that Wade Furlong is a pretty fantastic artist, does a lot of really crazy, awesome stuff. You know, he sent me an email uh, recently about my turtles art he's like you know your art's good uh he was asking me about some art he wanted to use he said but i really prefer your your older art you know those stuff with with i imagine the the crazier looking characters and the crazy dynamic perspective and i had to i sent him an email back and he didn't reply to it but i was like you know what thank you really appreciate it you know you're a fantastic artist and i'm not you're a really good fine artist i'm not really at that level and uh uh and i appreciate the the kind words you know but but so you know you know i had to stop doing that because i was losing work because people would go oh, rob takes that foot and look how crazy he makes that foot and that leg it was getting in the way that sort of stuff of my heart that gets me on a whole different rant but um so you know not not to veer off uh, um, t- um tethered subject getting back to inspirational versus house style what is a house style what a house style would be i'm going to go into top cow right top cow comics and or Aspen Comics, right, or, or Disney, right? And there's going to be a style for this given project that I'm going to fit. An art director laid down the law and said it's going to be like this. If you work on Ben 10, the cartoon, there are model sheets and style guys. You don't just get to animate your own Ben 10. You want to see what happens when animators do whatever they want in a movie? Go watch the first Fatal Fury. Fatal Fury, the motion picture, right? It's not the first Fatal Fury movie. It's actually the third. But it's Fatal Fury, the motion picture. It's an anime movie that came out in the uh, mid-90s. And whole sequences of that film are animated by different by different artists, and they just do whatever they wanted with the style. <laughs> like like uh, the main character Terry, uh, he he, and if I haven't seen it in a while, guys, so if I goof the names up, don't don't fucking email me about it. So, but the main character just completely during fight sequences just completely changes style, just freaking flips, and it's like you look at it and go, wow, that's way different, and. It kind of flies. It's all right. Like, looking at Japanese anime, you're like, oh, well, whatever. I mean, it's close enough, but fine. But if that happened in the middle of, like, Lion King, well, all of a sudden, like, Simba the Cub starts to look, you know, is drawn like in a Pooh Bear style. I mean, it wouldn't fly for an American release, a big motion picture release. And I know out here in the West, we're just not going to we, – we, we, we do not overlook that stuff. <laughs> you know, you, you'll, you'll see it sometimes in a movie. Like, uh, you'll see a movie like Green Lantern where – all the CG's done pretty well. And the minute he starts flying, it's animated like, like you know, bad Rocket. Like, Rocketeer was more serious than this. Like, it's just really poorly. And you're like, who, what animator took over this section of the film? Because it's just not really in tone with everything else that's going on in the movie. Uh, so, so a house style means, means that there's a, a, a an expectation to deliver a certain look. And you are meeting that look. All right, and that means I'm 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 no longer the quarterback at that point. I'm running the ball. I'm I'm that guy. And I'm fine with that. I I'm, I don't mind that. It's always a good exercise. I try to try to blend a little bit of everything in my life. Anchors me as an artist. Keeps me interested. And you'll learn things from other people. You know, when an artist, when an art director or someone sits down and works in a style, you know, and then you're working in that style, then you know you can't go. Oh, you stole that style. It's like no, I, the job was to work in that style. All right, and the customers are expecting that that look. So I'm playing around that game. It's very difficult to to describe that to you know the talkbackers on the internet who just wanna they just wanna point something out. I know where you got that from. You know, you're this, this, and that. And they move on. And don't fucking impress me. I don't. You know, whatever. You can do that if all you want. But the reality is, sometimes you have to work in a house style. Uh, when you don't, you get an, you get a situation where like you know you have like I remember back in the '90s. Um, I really love Wet Works, the comic, and that was drawn by Willis Potassio. Had a really great illustrated you know dark gothy thing and all of a sudden like this cartoony ed mcginnis kind of thing came into play with the book and but they were still doing mature themes and it just a cartoon and that it just didn't mesh up with i i, I was expecting yeah I, I tend to find a lot of people a lot of people and artists whatever consumers in general don't like a product not when it's bad but when they had an expectation of what it was supposed to be and got something completely different. So 
these are again various different topics that uh, I should cover on when a later date because I'm running out of time here. Uh, so to recap, with the art thieves, a three part thing. Uh, the first one was about stealing outright. The second one was about influences, and this one was, you know, sort of a cross between inspirational and house style. And I go on and on about all this. If you have any emails or questions or concerns or you want to retort or whatever, please email me at uh, rob at sketchcraft.com, C-E-K-E-T-C-H-C-R-A-F-T.com. And, you know, see me on DeviantArt, you know, say hi, all that other good stuff, Facebooking. And I will talk to you all real soon. Thanks, bye.